Most people are familiar with the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that unfortunately covered Pompeii and a number of nearby cities back in April of 79 Anno Domini. AD. Now, when we studied what happened to the people of Pompeii, all of the results are pretty darn grisly. You have pyroclastic flows coming down from Vesuvius, which is superheated gas and tons and tons of material and ash and rock and liquid hot magma and lava when it gets up there. And this can go hundreds of kilometers per hour, 700 kilometers per hour or about 430 miles per hour and is over a thousand degrees Celsius. What we think happened when this pyroclastic flow encountered people, if they are unfortunate enough to encounter it, was that their soft tissues immediately vaporized. And when they were surrounded by all this hot material, things inside of their body, inside casing, like a brain, was heated up so much that the brain cracked, well, the skull cracked and the brain basically exploded like a pressure cooker. That's terrible. This was a terrible way to go. And a new study appearing in the New England Journal of Medicine has an even grislier tale. So researchers were looking at people found in a specific part of Pompeii, right here, right down near the water. They were trying to escape. They were lucky enough to be far enough away from the volcano that they could see the eruption. And so they tried to escape by going to some nearby boathouses on the water trying to escape to the water. When they got to those boathouses, the pyroclastic flows, the ash found them first and they were trapped inside of these uh, stone boathouses. Now what happened is as these boathouses were encapsulated by all of this thousand degree material, it heated up, but the stone didn't melt. And so this boathouse acted like an oven and the people who were hiding inside were baked alive literally. And we found something odd when we examined their corpses thousands of years later. What we found was that instead of their brains exploding, their brains were vitrified. In other words, their, their brains were turned into a glass-like material. When the scientists were looking at these sites, they found brain matter, hair, body oil that wasn't found at any other location indicating that it was like a brain. And when they found that brain, it wasn't charred to a cinder. It more so had that glassy, spiky looking appearance that glass so often has. And so because of the specific variables that these people encountered, not being immediately vaporized um, and being baked at around 960 degrees Fahrenheit in a stone oven for hours and hours, their brains turned into glass. And now we add yet another grisly footnote at the base of Pompeii. Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live. Ooh, starting out a little heavy, but I promise you it's going to get more fun because, hey, look, I'm taking all your questions off the top of my head. I'm not a working scientist. I don't have a PhD, but I do know a little bit about a lot of sciencey and pop culture -y things, and I'm going to do my best to make it entertaining and interesting to you on what I think is the only live science show on YouTube. So if you have any questions for me that you think I might be able to answer, if I don't know, I will admit that because that's good science. Put it in the chat on YouTube, and if it's a good question and you're not spamming, we will get to it. I have Voice of the Void, Nate, here to assist me. What up? What's up, Kyle? Oh, I don't know. Just talking about glass brains. I'm like, Pompeii? More like Pompeii. That sounds terrible. Nice. Yeah. Our my best. first question is from Sam Average Man. The Average Sam Man. Yeah. How can crustaceans breathe on both dry land and underwater? Huh. I don't know. Do some crustaceans have long-like features? I don't think so. So uh, I, I, might, I might boot this one because I'm not totally sure. I believe they breathe through like spherical, uh, spherical like uh, orifices on the sides of their body. So if you imagine like uh, the side of something like a langostina, uh, a lobster, they have these spiracles, which are like little holes, and that's where they get their gas exchange. 
Um, and that depends on the surface area of the crustacean, and so that's why they don't get so big. It's kind of like why spiders don't get so big, because they don't have enough surface area for their volume. Um, but I could be wrong about that. Why can they breathe on land? I, I don't know. They might have some kind of lung-like structure, or they're taking an air like this, but uh, I'm going to say I don't know this one. If you know it, please put it in the chat. I would love to be illuminated by your nerdiness. From Ultra Flygon. Woo! Why do we see fireworks before we can hear them? Because the speed of light is much, much faster than the speed of sound. So to give you an idea, the speed of light in what you Earthlings call air is a pretty much the speed of light. So it's uh, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It's 300,000 kilometers per second. So that's very, very, very fast. To compare that, the speed of sound in what humans call air is about 343 times 10 to the nothing. Well, that's not true. That'd be multiplied by zero. 343 meters per second. So as you can see here, the speed of light is thousands and thousands, if not millions of times, well, hundreds of thousands of times faster than the speed of sound. So when a firework goes off, the light from that reaches your eye much, much quicker before the sound reaches it there, uh, makes it there because these two uh, speeds, are, uh, velocities are so different. What's next? From SOS Task Mage. This is right, right? Move the decimal. Nail it. Okay. okay. From SOS Task Mage. You like jazz? I do like jazz. I listen, to, when I'm writing my scripts, I listen to jazz pretty much uh, for the entire day. So for like nine hours, I'm listening to jazz. And I discovered two jazz artists that you may not have heard of if you like jazz that I am fascinated with because they are awesome. One is an older jazz musician from Japan. His name is Ryu Fukui, and he has some wonderful albums. If you'd like, if you'd like to listen to a modern uh, Japanese uh, pianist, her name is Hiromi. Hiromi Uera, and she is virtuosic. Uh, she is so good and so fast and so creative. Uh, just search Hiromi on YouTube, H-I-R-O-M-I uh, on YouTube. I, she blew my mind when I first discovered her, and I was so happy that I did. What's next? From Dragon Buster 117. Uh, we'll see. What species of spiders have the strongest silk? That goes to Darwin's bark spider, I believe. And they, uh, they kind of, oh, <laughs> uh oh. And they kind of look like, they kind of look like this. Kind of like these big butts with a head segment. And then, of course, as arachnids do, they, this is a perfect spider, by the way. As arachnids do, uh, they have eight legs. But, um, when we observe these spiders, these are the spiders that can, uh, let's put it this way. These are the spiders that can drag webs all the way across something like a river. So these webs can go all, span large rivers and have the ultimate tensile strength to do so. They attach something like one tree and then they let the silk out and the silk, uh, thanks to the wind, gets blown across the river and then attaches to another tree. And they can make these webs that are like meters wide, enormous for a tiny, tiny spider. So they have the strongest silk, I believe, of any spider. I could be wrong, but I believe it's Darwin's bark spider. And they live in, in rainforests and, and, and things like that. This is what you will usually see even if it's not mentioned, when people are talking about the tensile strength of spider silk, they're usually talking about this particular spider. What's next? I love spiders. Spiders were so, are some of my favorite creatures. Uh, I used to be called the bug kid when I was a kid because I would go outside and catch spiders, observe them, and then release them. One day I found a praying mantis and I caught it in a cup from Subway and I showed it to the other kids and they freaked out and then I let it go. I had a weird childhood. A little bit. Mm. From Casey Aldrich. Hello. Cow, what's your favorite card from the new Magic set? Woo! I'm excited to build around Perforos. I have a lot of uh, cards that would fit very well into this sneak attack kind of strategy that I'm not using right now. Big artifact creatures, things you can get a lot of value in for paying only three. I know a lot about Magic the Gathering. For paying only three mana into something, uh, you could throw out like a uh, Thran 
or a uh, ooh, a worm coil engine would be good. A uh, yeah, these would be really good. And, and these big creatures like Atali, the Primal Storm, or uh, these uh, Avatars of Slaughter, those kind of things that are sacrificing themselves at the end step. Burfros would be pretty cool. I'm not really excited about Heliod because it seems like it's a one or two card combo, and that's yeah. I do like those, but not on mono white because white is not good in Commander. I don't want to bore the science of people with magic talk, but if you want to talk magic with me, hit me up somewhere else. I play so much. From Z Xavier Lambert. Hello. Uh, could Starkiller Base actually exist using real life physics? So I wrote an article about this when the movie came out, and I tried to, I tried to give you a sense of the energy output from this thing, and it's. It's stupid, like a lot of things in Star Wars. Not stupid, like, not interesting, but like, it's a stupid amount. So, if Starkiller Base was to drain... No, there are no green stars. What am I doing? Uh, if, if Starkiller Base was to drain something like a sun, which it looked like it was doing, it drains all the quote-unquote energy from the, a sun. And it's not really specified how exactly it's doing that, or why, or what have you, but if you took that figure to mean it's draining all the fusible material, or it's draining all the energy that the sun could get if it fused the rest of its material, then you have enough energy, uh, I estimated, uh, based on the gravitational binding energy of a planet size of Earth, which is um, 2 times 10 to the 32 joules, uh, there's so much energy in something like a star that you could destroy like a trillion planets. If you were to extract every single joule of energy from a star completely and perfectly, 100% efficiently, use that in planet destruction with like a Death Star kind of thing, you could destroy like trillions of planets. So destroying five, not that crazy in that kind of context. But to hold all of that energy inside of one planet, Nuh-uh. I mean, just think of how much material you'd be adding to a planet. Uh, you know, a million Earths could fit inside the sun. Now imagine trying to fit all of the sun's material inside of the Earth, or all the sun's energy. I believe you would destroy the planet. So, Starkiller Base... I... I don't think so. From Killian Melody. Ooh. Hey, wow. Kyle. Cool name. Yeah. Killian Melody. I've got to build a contraption. They kill people with violins. <laughs> I've got to build a contra contraption. Nate, Nate, Nate. I know. <laughs> Nate. I've got to build a contraption for an egg drop challenge. Oh, okay. It must be under 300 grams and no balloons allowed. Any ideas? <sighs> yeah, I mean, the egg drop challenge is a classic uh, challenge in physics and engineering courses. Uh, if you're not familiar, if you're not from the United States, and I'm sure they do it all over the world, the challenge is to... Uh, build an apparatus around an egg such that you can drop it off of the roof of your school and the egg is fine. Now, how would you want to do that? Well, so think about the, the forces imposed on an egg when you are dropping it. So, uh, force, as, as I'm sure you know, force equals mass times acceleration. We know this from Newton. Force also equals by that uh, mass times ex uh, change of velocity over time. Momentum change. So, one of the surefire ways to decrease the force on an object such as an egg would be to increase the amount of time that it takes to have this momentum change. The amount of time it is slowing down. Because if this denominator gets larger, then this overall force value gets smaller, as you know. So, how can we do that with something like an egg? Well, I think People, well, and me too, when I first tried this, you know, when I was a kid, people think if you just put, like, a bunch of padding around the egg, that's fine. And that's true, but you still do not have a whole lot of material here to squish. You don't have a whole lot of crumple zone. So even if you put a couple blankets around this egg, it'll probably do well. But you really want to maximize the time. So how could you do that? I've seen um, successful egg drops where it is, has more like a crash zone around it, like a crumple zone in your car. The front of your car is meant to crumple to do this exact same thing. So I've seen um, larger apparatuses, so it's like 
Imagine like a, a cardboard shell very far out from the egg that is supported by like collapsible trusses, whether that be like popsicle sticks or uh, uh, pipe cleaners or what have you, but it's like this collapsible matrix around uh, the egg. You see this kind of design in wheels. I think the Mars rover kind of has wheels like this. And so this is, if this crumples well, if this is designed to crumple well, you have a lot more distance to cover and hopefully a lot more uh, time between uh, time for the impact. And so it will lower the force on the egg, hopefully. So I would go with something like that, depending on the materials that you have. Um, doesn't have to be exactly like this, but think of maximizing the slowdown time. You don't want it to hit quickly. You want it to cushion. That would be my advice. Is this considered cheating? Did I just help you cheat in your class? I, th I think I did. If you win, tweet at me, please. And show me a picture. And then I'll take credit. I won't. This is just advice. What do I know? From PC74. I'm just an internet hair person. If climate change continues at the rate it is now, <laughs> What evolutionary traits would humans have to develop to adapt? Tricky question. Do you know why? Uh, climate change is all about rate. So right now, um, so if, if the climate was to increase by 1.5 degrees C, 2 degrees C, 3 degrees C, this is catastrophic levels of heating. It doesn't sound like that much, one degree, but that's average global temperature. You could have massive increases in, say, like Australia, like locally, where they had, to they had to develop a new color for their heat maps because it was so hot. On their heat maps now, the center of Australia looks like Mordor in the summer. It's like black. Anyway. So if that was going to happen over the course of, like, a thousand years or a million years... I, I, would, uh, I would expect life to adapt to it. Even um, insects, life as we know it, uh, other organisms can adapt to environmental conditions relatively, relatively quickly, within a few generations. But what is a human generation? As we extend our lives further and further with technology, our average generation time gets bigger and bigger. And so, you know, could, each generation could be 40 years, 50 years, what have you, 20, 30, 40, 50. In 50 years, climate change is going to be much worse than it is now, especially 100 years from now. 50 to 100 years is simply not enough time for evolution to act. If you think about how quickly life changes to adapt to radical changes in the environment, radical changes, we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds, millions of years. 100 years based uh, uh, compared to a million years, you know, we're, we're talking about a factor of, you know, 10,000. So it, it's, it's way, way too fast. So the problem with climate change, I don't know what adaptations we need because I believe climate change is progressing too quickly for us to naturally adapt to it. And that's why we have to unnaturally act to get this under, under control, to take it seriously, to take action, because we are not going to just deal with it a lot it, it might not wipe out the human race but is going to make it is going to make for hell it is going to destabilize economies it's going to destabilize people especially on the coast and that's going to make water shortages food shortages uh severe weather severe uh natural disasters like typhoons wildfires it's going to create national security risk because all these people migrating to all these other places it's going to be Bad. And we need to take it seriously now because we're not just going to adapt to it. <sighs> What's next? I uh, just want to quickly point out, somebody pointed out that your spider has seven legs and not eight. Oh, what's that? From Daniel C. You nerds. What would have happened? It got bitten off. It's a jungle out there. What would have happened to the solar system if Jupiter would have actually become a star? Um, yeah, so we did an episode about turning Jupiter into a star, and uh, we did it with a black hole, which was very interesting and uh, really got my mind juices flowing. And uh, in that paper that I was referencing, uh, they considered this happening over the scale of 
like millions of years. So if you started to turn Jupiter into a star, it wouldn't get as bright as our sun for millions of years. So this would really depend on how Jupiter turned into a star. If it turned into a star, a protostar, it's not even that, it's not even like, it, it's the minimum size. If it was the minimum size for a star, it really depends on how the rest of the solar system formed because of that, because it might not, and how it progresses, because it might not be hot enough to do anything. You, you'd, probably, you'd be able to see Jupiter in the sky, but I don't know if it would be at the luminosity required to really change life on Earth. It would change day and night cycles and that kind of thing, which would affect life on Earth and its development, its evolution. Uh, so if it wasn't hot enough, I think it would at least have effect on how life, if it's still progressed, progressed on Earth as, as stated. Diurnal cycles and nocturnal cycles and all that. From Bronson Patton. Man, a lot of cool names. And yeah. Is Bronson Patton a general? Bronson Patton. Four-star general, serve two tours in the void. What is your favorite science and why? Hmm. You know, I, I think about if I had to go back into school and I didn't do engineering, I did civil and environmental engineering because I wanted to help with climate change. But that was, that was many moons ago. Now I do this. If I had to go back, though, uh... I always thought astronomy was uh, very fascinating to me. I mean, you can tell by the Because Science episodes, I often go towards space and these giant astrophysical uh, phenomena. And I think uh, astronomy would be really cool. Um, but if not that, I think I'd probably pursue a PhD in some sort of engineering uh, related concept, uh, maybe. You know, I learned how to like divert rivers and stuff in college, you know, pretty cool geoengineering stuff. So. Um, Maybe astronomy, or, or I'd go straight into physics and just indulge myself in the stuff that I always love to talk about anyway. With a minor in, in experimental psychology. From Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson? Phil Jackson. The guy who owned the Lakers? Is that, a, is that the sports thing? Are we going to see a Wait, no, super... he owned the Lakers, right? <laughs> Phil Jackson? Yeah. Uh... Wasn't he a player? And then he coached the Lakers, or coached? I mean, I know sports <laughs> things. All right, we'll get. Look on. at me. Why wouldn't I? We'll go on to the question. I'll, I'll look it up. Are we going to see a supernova in our lifetime? Ooh. Um. Well, um. Our sun is probably. Well, our sun won't go supernova in in about a couple billion years. It's it's not big enough. It doesn't have enough mass to go supernova. So. Um, we'll get to that in a future episode of Because Science. So it's not going to be our sun, but uh, every 50 to 100 years or so in a galaxy the size of the Milky Way, a star on average, one of the billions of stars, uh, goes supernova. And we have actually observed a few over the centuries, but not very many. So I think our chances of seeing a supernova in our lifetime have gone up because technology is better. We have more telescopes, more researchers, more scientists, more people looking at the sky. So I think there's a good chance we'll, we'll see another one. But uh, for how many stars there are in, a, in the sky, we don't see all that many. And if, we, and if they are happening, we might not be pointed at it at the right time. I mean, you're talking about an infinitesimal uh, you know, pinprick in the night's fabric. But they get really, really bright for a long time. So who knows? But I, I think probably. If we can detect gravitational waves, we'll find a supernova. Well, what do I know? I, I haven't taken an astronomy PhD course. I want to. Who was Phil Jackson? Uh, <laughs> yes, he was a player in the NBA. And? I, uh, so, I Google know. it. I am. I know he's part of the Lakers. And? <laughs> Doesn't quite say. Ah, oh, fuck. Frick it. <laughs> Whoa. 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 Almost lost my mind there for a second. Do we have more questions? Yes. Chat, come on. From Neil Haynes. I'm not crazy. If you were a supervillain, not saying you are. Thank you. Where would you locate your secret base? Not in a volcano. You know what happened to those people? They, were, they have brain glass. That's terrible. Um, dark side of the moon, too cold. Uh, underwater lab, 
subduction zones and all that stuff. Uh, oh, eh. I want to be underground. I fantasize about living underground every day. I would be underground, and I would have an elevator that came out of a sidewalk panel. I would want to. I would want to be right right beneath the feet of those heroes who think they're so safe, but they're not. Something like that. Who's Phil Jackson? Phil Jackson coached the Lakers. Doesn't own That's what them. I said! I said he was a player, and then he coached. Yeah. He doesn't own them. And he's in talks to return to the Lakers, apparently, too. So I we'll know see. sports. I know a little... It turns into a... We're now a sports podcast. Welcome. I thought the Packers were going to do better. They didn't. End of podcast. From, from Flash 300. Oh, we'll see. In theory, if there was zero gravity, zero friction environment, could perpetual motion be possible? Hmm. If everything was zero friction? Um, so space is pretty close to zero friction. Things can move through space without ever stopping, really, at non-relativistic speeds. Um, but even if you took something that seemed like a perpetual motion device uh, into space, still the internal workings of it, like just material touching itself would create friction, and that friction creates heat. That heat is lost energy, and so you can never get more energy than you put into the system. Um, or at least not regain, nothing's 100% efficient. But if everything was frictionless and there was no frictional losses and everything was perfectly transformed into another form of energy, then yes, I guess so. But to have the situation, you'd have to circumvent some of the laws of the universe, which is why perpetual motion isn't a thing. People think it's like, oh, well, Tesla invented it and then the government had him killed or something. It's like, no, it's just against the laws of the universe. So, yes, if you bent the laws in the, of the universe towards the whims of a hairless ape on a small planet in the middle of nowhere, universally speaking, then yeah, we could have unlimited energy. Why not? But, then it, but once that happens, you can do a lot of things. From Cherry Dragon. I'm sensing not a lot of friction from that Phil Jackson slam. From Cherry Dragon. How That's bad nice. will it, would a Yellowstone eruption be? I think the super caldera in uh, Yellowstone. So it's not like, so this is more, I, I don't know what Vesuvius was. I believe it was a stratovolcano. So in a stratovolcano, there, it's made up of layers. So as uh, liquid hot magma bo bo <laughs> bubbles up to the surface, uh, the lava comes out and it cools. And then more lava comes out and it cools. And then it does this, kind of at like the angle of repose, kind of. And, uh, and then it eventually forms a stratovolcano, a stratified volcano or composite volcano. Um, in Yellowstone, by contrast, you just have flat ground, right his ear, and then you have a giant pool of magma underneath. And I'm not a volcanologist, but I know these super caldera, when they erupt, can be incredibly strong. And I believe, based on what I've seen in like documentaries and National Geographic and that, if this was to go off, I think it would probably destroy the country and black out a lot of the sky and be absolutely catastrophic. It'd be terrible. It'd be the worst natural disaster ever that humans have experienced, probably. And that's bad. That's all I got. I mean, any of this is bad. We're do You're talking about... Earth-sized catastrophes, yes, they would be bad. We can hardly, when the volcano in the Netherlands went off, we could hardly like fly around the planet in a certain part for like weeks. Imagine if an actual eruption on this scale happened. Last question to end on a little lighter note. Okay. <laughs> uh, from Joshua Taylor. Hello. If you could make one scientific discovery, what would you like to discover? Well, aliens. I'd love to discover life because that would be the most, well, I'm being selfish. It would be the most monumental discovery in human history to discover that we are not alone in the universe. Would I like that to be me? Sure, why not? That'd be pretty dope to have that in the record bir birks, but it's life. Um, but if I'm being selfish, all I really would want is to have some kind of legacy that is meaningful or helpful to people, which is kind of what I'm trying to do uh, with this whole enterprise. But at, at minimum, I've, I've 
often fantasized about discovering some effect in the universe or some very useful calculation that it could be called like the Hill effect or the Hill equation. You're like, oh, of course, <laughs> if we're considering this scenario, we need to use the Hill equation. I would love to just have something little like that, just to be in a, in a footnote in some physics textbook and just know that I contributed to our understanding of the universe just a bit. Um, with my current career, I don't think that's ever going to happen. But, you know, hey, we made an engine that throws blue whales out of the back of it for thrust. That's a hill engine. Start using that as a term everywhere. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this edition of Because Science Live. Whew, what a week. Still in January. Uh, I hope you had an awesome week. Next week, we're back with another episode, a cosmic episode. We have another uh, Because Science Live. We have another Footnotes where I answer all your comments, corrections, and questions. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And be nice to each other because in times like these, this is all we got. <laughs>